Good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to uh, show one more example of sh uh, shear moment diagrams, and then we move to the next part, which is the Hooke's law. So let's first consider one more example. Okay, say we have beam loaded. Let's put the load here. Five kilonewton per meter. And then you have a couple moment here. Three kilonewton times meter. This distance one meter. One meter and two meters. Now the question is draw shear slash moment diagrams. That means alternatively, sometimes you if you don't want to draw it, just give me the relation for V, shear force, at any location X, when X is between zero and four. So let's take a reference point, let's say X is left, any point, X, and this is between zero and four the entire length of beam. I'm actually asking, give me a relation for both shear force and moment relation versus X, two relations, or draw two diagrams for that, two plots. So in order to do that, what you do, you just go ahead and do the same thing with it. We just uh, first find external reactions if needed, and then you just uh, cut it uh, in different sections, and then you find the relations and then you plot it. Okay, now before I do that, how many different sec uh, intervals should I consider? How many sections should I consider? Let's put a point here. Let's say this is A, B, B. Now, how, how many different intervals should I consider in my analysis when I want to find these relations? Waiting on your response. Yes, uh, three, that's right. The correct answer is three. Uh, as you can see, from A to B, we don't really have any changes, right? Then suddenly at point B, you have external couple moment that shows up. So therefore between A and B is one of my intervals. Then from B to C, everything is smooth and nothing else shows up. Then suddenly from C, you have a distributed flow showing up. You see that? So you have three intervals, A to B, B to C, and C to D. Okay? So before I do that, uh, I want to uh, do like some sort of external reaction analysis to find uh, the moments at point A. And instead of that, I can do something else. Instead of finding, if I take, you see, if I take my reference from left, look at the X here, you see, if I take my reference from left, I have to first find the external reaction at A, right? There is no way. Because I'm going to be cutting it from here and then I'm gonna take the one on the left, right? What is other alternative? What is other alternative? Well, 
the thing is, if you take the system on the left, yes, you have to find the external reaction at A, okay? But look, if you take the system on the right, then you don't have to find the external reactions at A, right? But look, if you, if you want to take the one on the right, then you have to go through this trouble of uh, uh, considering two different forces when you do your sure moment uh, uh, relation, right? So what I do, one of one of alternatives is first I find the external reaction at A, and then I take the the system on the left, I cut it arbitrary x, I take the system on the left, and I just draw my FVD and I write my equation, and then I find shear moment diagrams. Okay, so let's erase the one on the right. We're not gonna do the one on the right. And also open up some space by erasing that. And I know my X is somewhere here, but I'm not gonna call it right now. First, I want to find reaction at point A. So I take the entire thing as system, and then I go ahead and put my loading. Now, if you, if you take the entire thing as your system in order to find external reaction at A, now look at this distributed load. The distributed load is purely external force to my system, right? I'm not cutting it somewhere between. So I can replace it with the point load. This is the rule of thumb. I said before, if your distributed load is purely external to your system and you're not cutting it somewhere between, then you can replace it with point load, right? Exactly like the way we did in vector aesthetics. Now I can load value is equal to five times two which is ten kilonewton and its location is simply one meter from right and one meter up to this point c okay so i replace that then i have this 3k and nothing else except that A, I have three components, A, Y. Well, I don't really write A, X, because I know I have nothing in the X direction, right? It's zero, right? So I save some space, and then you have M, A. Okay, that's your complete FVD. Now go ahead and write the equation. Summation of moments, about point A, zero. It's gonna give you MA, negative 3K, negative 10K times uh, 3 is equal to 0. And summation of force in Y should be 0. That would give you AY, negative 10K is equal to 0. So AY is, in fact, 10K. And MA is equal to 33 kilonewton meter. Three times 10, 30 plus three, you take it to the right, positive 33 kilonewton. So let's put it here. Let's go back to the original system. So you have MA, which is this way positive, and its value is equal to 33K. And also, you have a AY this way, and its value is equal to 10K. Now you can safely erase these pre calculations, open up some space. I wish we could. Uh, extend this whiteboard there is no way that you can change the size of whiteboard so you can drag it scroll it upside down and do more writing on a single whiteboard single page instead of opening a new page but i don't know that option is not in this software yet that would be very helpful to do that now i'm ready to do my sectioning right so i take a reference now my system, look, let me erase the, the entire thing as system. This, this entire thing was a system. If I want to find external reaction, right? So not, that's not no, no longer my system. So just 
height. Okay. Uh, the end result, the plots, the diagrams should look exactly the same. It doesn't matter if you take your x from left or you take your x from right. Your plot should look like the same. So I take my x from left and I cut it somewhere between a and b. You remember I have three intervals. Let's write it here. From these are my intervals. Intervals from a to b that are considered separately, these three intervals, from B to C, and then from C to D. Okay? So this problem is not really hard. Sometimes we have to do like eight intervals, 10 intervals. So this, this is not really that hard. So I do my first interval. So I'm cutting somewhere between A and B, as you can see. So your X is from left and I'm cutting it somewhere between A and B, anywhere. You see, this is X, this is not a, I don't fix it to a number like I did before. You remember we did internal loading section? We had that value fixed to a number, right? But I just take X and X is like a variable. It's anything between zero and one in this particular example. So if I, if I section that, then I'll have two alternative. System on the left, or system on the right. Now we have discussed this many times. Well, it's obviously easy to take the system on the left, right, and draw a FPD. So let's do that. I take the system on the left and draw a FPD. So with a little bit of exaggeration, that is my FPD. So here at this point, I have a 10K already, wall reaction, 33 kilonewton meter. And then at this point, X, look, from here to here is what? X, because that, that's the point that I'll cut it, right? So this point, let's call this point, point X, point X, right? So you're gonna get an X, and I know that, look, the anything in the axial direction, right, is zero. So I, I really don't want to uh, put extra marking on my FVD to just simplify it. So I, you just erase it because it's zero, right? So you're gonna get shear load V at X and M at X, okay? These signs are very important. On the left, system on the left, the shear positive is going down. Is positive going up on the right, not on the left. And MX is going always positive upward. That's it. That's my complete free body diagram when I'm cutting between point A and B. Now look at that. I don't have the 3K. You see in the original picture, uh, I have a three kilo Newton couple moment and also a distributed load. Now, in the system, the one on the left that I took, I do not have those. Why? Well, the answer is very simple. Because I'm cutting at a point between A and B. That means I haven't reached to the B yet. And because I take the one on the left, okay, I do not have the reactions on the system on the right because the system, my system is the one on the left. Sometimes I see a student put that everything, all of this loading on the system on the left, which doesn't make sense. Okay, so make sure you don't make that mistake. So MX, VX, everything else is included. So that's your complete free body diagram. So let's go ahead and write the equations. So, well, I can't write. I don't know why I can't write. Because some issue here. I don't know, I can. What's wrong here? Let's see. Maybe I'm out of my. Uh, let's see how, how much charge do I have in my pen? Because I use Apple Pen and probably it's not charged. I don't know why. Pencil is 100%. Well, so what's the problem?
Well, it says my pencil has a hundred percent charging, but I don't know why I can't write. Let's see, go to the chat room. Yeah, that really sucks. I, I don't, I don't know really why this thing doesn't write. Let's see, maybe. Oh yeah, I got it working. <laughs> Okay, sorry. All right, so let's go ahead and write the equations. Summation of force in Y zero. So that would give you 10K positive minus V at X is equal to zero. 10K positive negative VX is equal to zero. And then summation of moment at any point like X is zero. I take X because it eliminates two unknowns. Right, so let's do that. Mx positive, nothing come from Vx, then negative 10k times x plus 33k is equal to zero. Now, I want to explain this equation because I'm sure some of you guys are a little bit confused. Uh, so let's Let's go to this equation, summation. I'm talking about this term, this equation. Summation of moment about any point is zero, right? That, that's equilibrium equation, it's a Newton law. It's always valid as long as you are in equilibrium, which we are, right? So the reference point, I took this point right here, x, as my reference point. Why? Because I eliminate two unknowns, mx, vx. In fact, one unknown, vx. MX is a copper one. So that's a strategically good point to take as your reference for moment equation. So far it's good, right? Now let's expand that equation. When I expand it, uh, first I go compute the moment coming from MX. Well, it's because it's copper moment, you just simply add it or subtract it to the equation, right? And because you take your right hand and you see it's, um, uh, counterclockwise and your thumb is outward the plane so it's positive so that's the reason i have a positive term right here okay then the next term the moment coming from this vx well obviously because this vx is going through point x is passing through the point it's called concurrent that means the moment arm is zero so there is nothing coming from the vx no contribution in the moment equation okay so that that's also now let's go to the next 10 day. That can, when you actually on that, then you can you can understand this course very very well. So look, if I want to compute the moment of 10k with respect to point x, I should multiply that force by moment arm. The force value is 10k, but what is the moment arm? The moment arm is the distance between the that is acting. You remember the distance vector in vector statics? That's your distance vector. Okay. So if that's your distance vector, what is the what, what is the length of that distance vector? The length is the from point A, is from point A right here to the point X that you call it, which is X. You see the length is X. So I have to multiply 10K by X, right? And now because it's clockwise and you take your right hand and say this way is negative 10K. There you go. That's the reason I have negative 10K times X. You see this, that's important. Negative 10K times X. Now, finally you go to 33K and because copper moment you simply add it to the equation is equal to zero. Now let's solve for MX. What do I get? If you solve that equation for mx, you get mx, moment at point x is equal to 10k times x, negative 33k. That's it. So the shear, if you solve the shear at point x becomes a, and the couple moment becomes 10k times x negative 33k. Okay, so I want to plot it right now. If I want to plot that, let's write this equation somewhere before I plot it. 
let's collect them here. So let equation for shear at any location like X, I have three conditions. When X is between zero and one, when X between one and two, and also when X is between two and four, right? So I have to find three equations for shear. The first three equations I found it is 10K. I have not found the second and third. These are, these are empty yet. I will find them. I do more section and I'll find them. For moment, I have the same equation. You remember uh, in, the, in the calculus, you had this sort of equation that you, you open a bracket like that, you see, and then you have different condition and different equation. This is called piecewise, piecewise continuous polynomial equation, right? You had it before in vector in, in the calculus and basic, uh, you know, uh, uh, mathematics, you had this kind of equation. Now we have the same thing here. Uh, for a moment, we also have, let's write the one for a moment. I want to collect is equations. Sorry for the noise. Here, here we have a lot of people walking around this house. So, uh, for moment equation, we are going to have also three relation. The first one is 10k times x negative 33k when x is between 0 and 1. Okay, and then I am going to find the other ones before I plot them, All right? So the next one, uh, you know that this section that I did right here, let me circle around it, this section that I did, it works for any x between zero and one. But if I want to go further than b, then I have to kind of like start over again, right? So let's do that. So now I section it between B and C. If I do that, then you get this system. You kind of start over, make a new FVD. Now, later on, I, intro I show you a method that you don't need to do all this hard work. Everything is going to be obtained with one line. So you, you actually right now, <clears throat> you move your section a little bit to the right. Be, be any point between B and C, right? So that's your same X with the same reference, but now you're cutting between B and C. Now I take the system on the left and I draw my free body diagram. There you go. 10K. Go this way. 33. K, 10K, K, 33K, 10K. Now here you have, you have to include that 3K. Now here at this point X, you have VX and MX. And don't forget from here to here, is the length of this polar beam is X, right? So I included 10K, 33K. Also, I had to include the 3K because now this 3K is in my system. Look at this 3K. Now it is in my system, so I had to include it. Then you get MX, VX. Now I'm ready to do my if you do summation of y, that would give you 10k positive, uh, negative vx zero. So vx is still the same, but what about moment? Moment about any point like x zero. You get mx negative 3k. 
plus 3k, negative 3k plus 33k, and negative 10k times x, zero. So your moment relation becomes basically uh, 10k positive times x, negative 30k. So you have a jump in the moment diagram. So let's put it here in our table, in our equations. So the shear load, I'm going to put it here, 10K between one and two. You see, 10K positive. What about moment? The moment is going to be 10K times X, just like above, but you have a negative 30K instead of 33. This is between one and two, okay? Now between one and two, you have 10K, negative 30K, and the shear load is 10K, okay? So let's get rid of this uh, computation here. Now I go to do my final cut. And I'm going to do my final cut. That is a point between C and D. That is this point. So I just take that X. Let's do a little bit erasing here. All right, eliminate that, get rid of that. So that is I'm cutting somewhere like between C and D. My last interval, last cut. That's it. X, the same reference, but I'm calling between again. F, but look, you see that if you take the one on the right, is easy because you have just one part of distributed load and your equation becomes easy. Now I leave that as a homework. In fact, I'm going to write it right now. And now, can you plot them as a homework? You should get exactly the same curve for both shear and moment, when you check the system on the right, if you do it correctly, okay? So let, let me uh, draw a three body diagram for both parts. If I do the, the one on the left, I'm going to get something like this. Here, 10K, 33K, and here comes, 3k and then here comes just a part of this with the load just a part of it not all of it its top is 5k newton kilonewton per meter and bottom could be anywhere between 2 and 4 okay and there you also you're gonna get v at x M at X uh, and no axial load. And that is pretty much all we have on the system on the left, okay? Now your system on the right is going to be like this. The same thing, MX, the same V, but it goes up positive and also a part of that distributed load that you have here. Top is 5K Newton over meter. Now, important things. From here to here, don't forget that. From here to here is what? Is X. It's very important. Pay attention. From here to here is constant one from here to the beginning of this load is constant one again. But look, from here to that point is X. That means from here to here is what? Waiting on response. What you are writing the blue part? X minus two. X minus two, thank you. X minus two, okay? So now, 
<laughs> important thing. If you go to the system to the right, what should I take as this length? The blue line on the light, right. What is that? What should I write there? Here. That length, what should I write for that length? Four minus six. Exactly. Please email me for a quiz bonus, please. Okay, after the class. So that is the entire length minus x. What is the entire length? Four. So here you write four minus x. Right? Some of the students take that also as x. And then they uh, they find the relation on left and right, and then they plot it, and they, they get different curves. And then they say, well, uh, this is not what Ari said. They, they, these curves are different. Well, look, that is 4 minus x. Now, if you take that 4 minus x, and you write the equation in this system on the right, you get, you know, you, you get something for mx on the right, a relation for mx and a relation for vx on the right okay two different relations and if you write equation for system on the left then you get a relation for mx on the left and a relation for vx from the left and look these equation they may not look the same may not may not look the same. Why? Because your reference is different. But when you plot them, you should get exactly the same. When plotted, when plot them, then you get exactly the same value, right? Now, this is the homework. You don't have to turn it in. There is no deadline, but please do it just to increase your understanding, okay? Now, I'll just go ahead and do, now you have the FVD for the system on the right. I'll just go ahead and do my FVD and everything, the equation, just for the system on the left, okay? So, this is my system on the left. If I write the equation, what do I get for? Let's do it together, okay? Let's uh, do this equation, summation of force in y, zero, okay? Let's uh, start from left to right. Add all the forces in y direction. The first thing I have is 10k, so positive 10k, right? The 33k, that's a couple moments. It doesn't add to the forces. So you escape that, you escape the 3k, it's still a couple moment, right? The next thing you see is what is the this force, the value of this force. What can I do? Well, because it's this distributed load right now is completely external to my system. You see that? At this point, it's completely external to the system. So I can replace it with the point load. And what is the value of the point load? Waiting on response. Five times x minus two. Exactly. Five k. Don't forget the k. Five k times x minus two. Okay, that's the value of the uh, force. Now, where is the location it's acting on? You remember when we replace each distributed load, we have to find the area. That's the value of force, and now the location that I should put the single load. That location is exactly, that's right, x minus two divided by, so from this point x, this distance is x minus two divided by two, okay? So if I, uh, if I want to just add to the forces, what I need to do is to add this 5k, and don't forget, it's going down, so you say negative 5k times x minus two, right? 
it may look a little bit strange. You say, well, the value of, what is the value of the force? Well, the value of the force is 5K times X minus two. So you don't get a number, like a decimal number, it's a, it's a formula, but it actually shows the value of the force corresponding to that fraction of the distributed load, right? So now it, it makes sense. So you say negative 5K times X minus two because it goes down. Now, finally, you go to VX. You say negative VX, right? You include everything. Is equal to zero. Solve for VX, you get shear load. Is equal to 10K, negative 5K times X minus two. VX is equal to 10K, negative 5K times X minus two. That's your shear. So let's put it up there in the equation. So here on the top, I just put 10K, negative 5K times X minus two. That is when X is between two, X between two and four, right? There you go. Now we go to the moment. We go to find the moment. Can erase this thing to open up some space. For the moment, I write moment equation. Summation of moments about any point, like point X should be zero. Now let's expand that equation. You get MX, right? Now what should I write for a moment coming from this 5K, let's highlight it with green. You see 5K times X minus two. This is the value of the force. What should I write from the moment coming from this force with respect to point X? With respect to point X, what should I write? Waiting on the response. I should write the value of the force times its distance, okay? And then I take my right hand to see if it's positive or negative. So what you are right here? That's right. That's right. So the way you do that, you say the value of force is 5K times X minus two times the moment arm, which is the distance, which is X minus two. So you just simply write it plus 5K X minus two to the second power. Divided by two. Why second power? Because, look, let, let's do this algebra right here with a different column. You multiply the value of force, which is 5K times X minus two by moment arm, which is X minus two divided by two, right? Now group these two terms together. Then you have 5K X minus two to the second power divided by two. And it's also positive because when you take your right hand, your thumb is going outward of the whiteboard, right? So uh, now I go to the next one. Then I do have negative 3K, this guy, because it's negative, I just subtracted the equation. And then I go to the next one, plus 33K, this guy, and I add it. And then finally, I have negative 10K times X, right? Is equal to <clears throat> zero. So solve this equation for MX. What do we get? MX is equal to negative 5K over two, X minus two, to the second power 
this guy is positive 30k you go to the right negative 30k then plus 10k times x is a second order polynomial you see so uh, what i did i just simplified that equation take keep mx on the left and every on the right so you get negative x minus 2 square then uh, negative 30k and plus 10k times x so let's write it here negative 5k over 2 x minus 2 square negative 30 you know i can that linear term first because it has higher order plus 10k times x then negative 30k that is my moment equation for x between 2 and 4 now i'm done if you write these equations like that in the exam i simply accept it i really don't want you guys to plot because the computer can plot, can draw the curve, right? It can be automated with the computer. So it's not really a big deal. But finding the equations is very important. You have to either plot this equation or find it, report the equation like this in a table. That what equation do I have between like two and four? What equation do I have between four and five? Like that, right? So now let's go ahead and plot it. So if I want to plot it, I need to erase the, all these things I have done so far. Take some time to just erase this graph. All right. Now I want to plot this relation. So I just extend, so this is my x, this goes for shear, and this goes for moment. x for shear, x for moment, so this is shear, and this is moment, all right, two curves. So always look at the question, sometimes you ask for three curves, but look here, I have shear on the top right, and moment. So I have two curves. I have to report two curves. All right. So let's do first say where well, I have three and one, two, three. So you know where to plot what, right? This this greatly simplify your uh, steps, makes you just systematic when you want to plot it. Now Let's uh, plot the shear force between 1 and 0 and 1. So you get positive 10. So let's say this is 10k positive. So you have positive right here for shear. And then you, uh, it, you can also continue between 1 and 2. You also have the same value and it's positive 10k. Now let's uh, go ahead and uh, plot the shear between uh, two and four. Now look on the on the right. You see this equation that I'm circular. I'm, I'm going to plot that equation. That equation is equation of line. How many how many uh, data do I need to plot a line? We talked about the last class. Right. It looks like only <laughs> one person is contributing the class and the other participants are either uh, not uh, paying attention or, but no, I'm sure that you pay attention, except one person that is always absent. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and plot the last one. Uh, the last one, I need two points. So the first point, I take x is equal to 2. So put x is equal to 2 in that equation. 
you see the beginning and end. The beginning x is equal to two. If you put x equal to two, you get positive 10k right here. At x2, your value of curve is right here. What about x is equal to four? The very last point of the beam, the point D. If you put x4, then you get four minus two, two times negative five, negative 10 plus positive 10, zero. There you go. Now you connect with two dots. Find that goes zero. That's your shear diagram, right? So if, you, if they give a beam like that to you, you have a shear diagram that is, you don't have any discontinuity, you don't have any jump, right? Why? Because uh, you don't have a single shear load that appears somewhere in the middle of the beam. That causes discontinuity in shear, but you don't have that, right? Now let's go and draw the moment diagram. For the moment diagram, let's start with this guy. You have 10K negative 33K. Again, it's a line. How many points do I need? Two, right? The first point put X zero. What do we get? Negative 33. Negative 33K right here. For point uh, zero, if you put negative 33K. If, what, what about point one? If you point, put point one, then uh, I'm talking about point B. If you put X1, right, then you get 10 times one, which is 10 negative 33, is negative 20, uh, 23, right? So you have a line that goes like this. Goes like this. And this one is negative 23. Okay, so uh, then I want to plot that guy. Again, what, what, what do I need? Two, two points, right, because it's a line. If I put x is equal to one, what do I get right here? The, which is point B. It's uh, negative 20, which is right here. So you have a little bit jump right there, you see? If you put one, you get negative 20. So you have a jump going up here. And then you put the uh, X location of point C, which is two. Now put two here. Then you have two times 10, 20 negative 30 is negative 10. Negative 10 right here. Negative 10. Then connect here to here. There you go. You see that's negative 10K right here. Negative 10K, right? And finally, you plot this equation, the last equation. How many, uh, what's the degree of equation? Equation is the second degree equation, is a polynomial, is a parabolic equation, right? So how many points do, do you need to plot that? Well, the answer is three. Whatever the degree is, the degree is two, right? You add one to that and say three points. So you can take one point here, one point here, and one point somewhere like, for example, here in the middle, right? Now, if you do that, what, what do you get? Well, let's do that. Uh, if you take X is equal to the point D, the very last point, X is equal to four, right? put x is equal to four. What do I get? Let, let me grab the calculator. So you get four minus uh, two, two uh, to the second power four divided by two, two negative uh, 10K and uh, plus 40K, positive 40K, negative 40, 30K is zero. So this is zero. And this point you get, also negative 10k when you put x is equal to 2 you get negative 10k and if you put somewhere between then you get a curve like this that goes eventually to zero you see 
like that. You never get positive, it's always negative. So let me let me move shift this curve up so we can because right now we get some scaling problem. So let's, uh, let's do some undo here. So let's say this is your x right here. Let's say that's your x. Move it up, and then your curve becomes a parabolic second order polynomial that the convexity is down. There you go. There you go. Go zero here. Zero here, negative 10k here, and is negative. So everywhere you have negative number, negative number here, negative number here. And don't forget, you have a, a small, beautiful little jump here. Why do you have a jump here at point B? Why do you have a jump here? Here you see, you have a jump. Why? Waiting on a response? Exactly, exactly, thank you. Uh, because there is an external 3K moment that is applied externally. You remember when I said when we have external shear, then we have a jump in the shear value. When we have external moment, I mean copper, I'm not talking about distributed, copper, copper moment. Then we have a jump in the moment diagram. So that's your diagram. So look, as an engineer, if you look in this equation on the right, well, these are exactly the same information that, uh, let's put the equal sign, these are in fact the same information that you have a plot on the left. You see the left and right are basically same. But as an engineer, which one do you prefer? Well, if you ask me, I would say I would prefer I, I would prefer the plots. Because by just looking at the plot, you can instantly find the maximum minimum. For example, if somebody asks me at what location maximum moment happens? This is kind of like a design question for designing a seal structure. Then I can immediately pinpoint point A right here, you see? The value, the absolute value of moment is maximum at A, at the wall. So if I want to design this structure based on the uh, intensity of internal moment, I would consider A as my design point right, the station A. So uh, the, the plot, the reason that they say draw shear moment diagram is because it gives you better engineering perspective and feeling and intuition rather than equations. But in my class, like if I, in the exam, if I say, well, find this relation, if you just give me this relation, I, I, I give you the full credit. Right? You don't really need to go through the plotting. So now I want to talk um, about displacement. So far, I want to talk about Hooke's law. Now open another slide. So Hooke's law, Hooke's law. Hooke's law says uh, everything that is linear elastic material everything, you can corresponding this like a spring. It behaves, Hooke's law says it behaves, it behaves like a spring. Everything that is linear elastic. And let me tell you, most of the things in engineering is linear elastic. Uh, that means that uh, we don't have damage, we don't have permanent, uh, you know, uh, deformation. We don't have rapid movement, like heating, like changing in the crystal uh, crystallization. We don't have that, right? So your loading is very, very, very slowly. And the amount of work load is small. That means when you leave, when you release the specimen, it's gonna come back to the original point. That's called elastic, elasticity. 
So let's go on the curve. Uh, let's say, let's do a little bit of experiment together. Let's say you have a specimen. So this uh, little bar with cross section, the cross section here with A, and the length is, uh, the length is L, and let's put it to the machine. Apply tensile load to that. So this is the upper. Uh, and this applies tension. So this uh, upper part goes up and the lower part goes down, right? So that's a schematic of my experiment that I put this little bar, I fix it in the machine, we call it tensile stress machine, tensile. We have one of these in the lab, actually two of them. Okay, and uh, we start loading it. We start loading this guy, this uh, specimen with the stress. And then every time I load this with a new force, I increase this ten tension. Then I uh, go and compute the stress here. So you have, uh, you have a, a force transducer, force trans, User, which is a kind of sensor to measure the force, the axial load. And you divide that by area to get sigma, the stress. You remember the axial stress, we defined the stress in the last class and I put some more videos to define it more accurately. So you have kind of measured sigma and also you kind of measure the displacement by a displacement gauge, a strain gauge, right? So this is going to elongate and displace. So you measure the amount, the amount this is going to displace like, uh, right? And then you, uh, uh, you to compute what we call it right now, I'm going to introduce you, we call it a strain, right? So let's define here a strain is the strain is relative displacement is nothing new it's just relative displacement and we know displacement very well from the kinematic course so this is defined at that amount you see this amount of delta the displacement from the original length on displaced length divided by original length this is called a strain, right? And also more accurately, this is called the normal strain or axial strain. So you have a bunch of vocabulary here. Normal strain, like everything, look at this beam. Everything in this direction is normal. That's the reason you have force N. You remember we have symbol N for that, that direction. And also some people call it axial. So therefore you have normal stress, which I show you by sigma, and also you have normal strain. So this guy, the stress is kind of like type of uh, stress, force, area, you know? This guy is kind of kinematic, right? Displacement, movement. Now, what is Hooke's law? Hooke's law relate these two parameters together, right? So now let's go back to the experiment. Let's say I get this data from my machine and I plot it on a curve. So I make a curve like that. The X axis, I make it a strain and the Y axis put the stress. Right, so every time I apply the load here, like I start with zero Newton, you see, and then I increase it. I make it like 10 Newton, 
both sides and then I make it like 500 newtons and I go up. Every time I increase the force, I am going to compute stress and strain and put it on this curve. So the data I get is like this. The first thing you have zero, zero at zero, right? If you don't have any force, that means if, if your stress is zero, So that means epsilon, which is displacement divided by L is also zero. So basically your point, the first point that you don't apply any force, it must be at zero. Then you increase the force. From men. You see, we don't have a formula yet. We are just in the lab trying to figure out what's the relation between sigma and epsilon, right? So you get another point, you increase the force, you get another point, you increase it, you get another point like that. You see? It goes all the way up, and then you go to a region. You kind of flatten, okay? It's not going up. It goes like this, and then let's raise these things here. It goes all the way here. And then at some point, suddenly goes down, and then you hear a noise, and it breaks. The specimen breaks. So what happens here? This uh, bar, you see, uh, this is probably the most intuitive part that you say, well, if I continue loading, it's going to break. And then yes, you're right. If you continue loading, it's going to break. Right, but look here, we have two separate region. The linear region and the rest of it is called non-linear. Elasto plastic region. Some people call this the proportional region. And as you can see, if, if I connect these dots together, I am I have kind of like some sort of like a line here, and then I go to kind of flatten and then suddenly I break. I have something like that, right? So what I want to say, we're not going to consider this part the nonlinear region in this course. You see this relation is kind of ugly. It's like nonlinear relation is complicated. We're not going, this is like a graduate course in plasticity. We're not gonna consider this relation in this course, okay? So what we have here is only this part the linear relation. And you can immediately say, hey, I can find relation law to this data here, right? There you go. And then I can say the relation between sigma and epsilon is also because you can get this slope. You can compute this fit regression compute regression slope this is slope we call it e or young young's module of elasticity it's just a constant it's just just this slope is when you see e that e is in fact a constant and look you can see that this also depends on the type of material like if you put aluminium specimen that's going to have a different slope compared to steel even in the steel family you have high carbon steel a uh, different kind of steel right so you a bunch of this data for e materials. In fact, they have something called 
handbook of mechanical engineering. And in that handbook, when you go to a section, then you see it's like 150 pages of different tables for various kind of values of E for different materials, right? So this information will be given to you. So you have E, when, when they say E, you always have this E, you get it from tables, okay? So the, as you can see, we can write a relation between sigma and E, sigma and epsilon. Sigma is equal to E times epsilon. And because it passed through zero, there is no B here, this B is zero, right? Because this line is passing through the zero. So this is called Hooke's law, this linear relation. This is called Hooke's law, right? So how can we use the Hooke's law? Well, it has a lot of uh, usage. You remember we talked about indeterminate relations and uh, vector statics that we, we didn't have enough equation to solve for unknowns. We use Hooke's law to make everything determinate, to provide additional equation to solve for indeterminate equation to make them determinate. So that's the main, the main application of Hooke's law. There are other applications like design. So by using Hooke's law, you can find maximum stress, max stress, and then you can, you can design your material. We're going to have some example next class, how you can use Hooke's law to design, right? So example. Let me give you a Erase that. In fact, let's open up a new uh, slide. All right, E is equal to 200 gigapascal. So this is given to you is a, just a steel bar, it's a steel bar. Now for the first time, it, it really matters if you have aluminum or steel or wood or concrete, you know, so far, starting from vector statics, really the type of material didn't, didn't matter, right? So we could just find the external reaction force and we were done, the problem was solved. But now we're just starting to uh, take the part, type of material into account when we do analysis, which is really cool. It's like the first time we just understand that, well, I, my engineering intuition tells me that the type of material matters. And the answer is yes. And now we're considering the fact that top of different type of material can uh, completely give you different physics, right? They, because they break at different points. Now, let's say you have a steel bar, the length is one meter, the diameter is two centimeters. So it's kind of like very thin bar and it's long, right? So you fix it to the wall, at one end, and at what another other end, you apply two kilonewton force. Now, I ask this question: Find the displacement of point B. So this point B, point A. How much point B delta B will move to the right? Right. So you know that from your intuition. If you apply this load, this guy is like a chewing gum. It's going to elongate to the right. like that, and then you have some sort of like displacement, 
right? So how can you compute the displacement? Well, the answer is Hooke's law. Oops. Oh, we, are, we already studied that. So sigma is equal to E epsilon, right? So if that means that if you, if you find sigma at any point, like any section, if, let's say you cut it here, and this is my section, and if you find sigma there, you can just substitute values here and find the displacement. But don't forget that this is this relation is only is only for a part for a part that has that has constant. cross-section, right? Which is, in this case, I really do have a constant cross-section, right? My beam is not tapered. I don't have variation in area. So this relation applies to this part, right? So let's, let me go and substitute values here. So let's first compute sigma instead of sigma. I can say the force at this section, right, divided by, so I'm just substituting definition of sigma, force divided by area in that section is equal to, E is already there times, what is the definition for epsilon? Is delta over initial length, right? So your displacement delta would be F L over EA. Just multiply this equation by L over E, both sides, and then you end up with delta is equal to FL over EA. Now let's plug the number in it. Delta is equal to F, what's the value of force at any section? Now this is the thing, you, you, you go ahead and draw the axial load diagram. If you have the diagram, you just look at the diagram and at that point you find the value of force. Now what's the value of force at any point? 3K, right? 3K constant, 3K. So three times, don't forget that K. K is 10 to three, right? Times L. The next thing I substitute is the length. What's the value of length? One meter times one divided by EA. E is equal to 200, don't forget G, gigapascal, that G is 10, 10 to nine. This is the most confusing part I have in my classes that the student either forget to put that K in or G, and then they end up with wrong result, either in the lab or in the lecture course, right? So 200, 10 to nine times the area, which is pi, the radius, which is one centimeter, 10 to negative two meter square. That is equal to, let me put in the calculator. Let's put in the calculator. Spreading calculator 10, 3, divided by 200, E9 times pi times 1, E negative 2, square. So that is 4. Point seven seven to ten to negative five meter, and you can write that as forty seven or forty forty eight 
micrometer. 48 micrometer. Guys, that's a very small value. Right? You have to you have to take a magnifying glass and you barely see it under even magnifying glass. Now, you if you think about it, it makes sense because look, in engineering, we don't usually see the displacement. The material is so hard and rigid that when you apply loading on it, we don't we don't see the displacement. For example, this office that I'm working in, this building, right? Every time I move from across this building, I have some sort of displacement in the entire building. But because it is in the micrometer range, I, I don't really I don't really see it, right? Because in the micrometer range. So that's that's all I want to say for today, and uh, I'm going to up upload more videos from uh, re related to the displacement and Hooke's law. And please go ahead and watch the videos. And hopefully by the end of today, I'm going to open up a section for your lab reports. Don't forget the lab reports. You need to work on it. Uh, I'm going to upload sections so you can, when you write your report, you can upload it. Okay, for other lab reports. Uh, so uh, let me know if you have any question before I finish this class. Any question? Well, if you if you don't have questions, I I'm going ahead and go uh, finish this class, uh, and I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, at one p.m.